Right, well, good morning, Belmar. It's so good to be back. <clears throat> uh, I was gone for about two weeks. Hopefully all of y'all had a great Christmas with family, uh, friends. Marianne, Tobin, and I really enjoyed the opportunity. We got to travel to New Mexico, where my wife's family's at, and Austin, Texas, where my family's at. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was actually the very first time that my grandparents got to meet their great-granddaughter, Tobin. And so that was really cool, you know, getting to see pictures and just kind of setting that precedent in our family. And I think, I think that's one of the things about the holidays that like, we enjoy so much is that some of our fondest memories are because we're spending time with our family. And see, I think the funny thing about family is I think they're like, I think they're supposed to love you no matter what. And I remember, I remember being like 10 years old, my mom, she bought this, this brand new carpet for our house. It was, it was a Berber carpet. I'm a, I think that's what it's called, like real nice Berber. She was so excited. She'd never had carpet as a little girl or something. Her house is crazy. Um, but she was super excited. It was like this off-white, had the little like divots in it or something. She loved it. And within a week, I had spilled uh, red candle wax all like right in the middle of the living room. Because I was trying to show her this cool toy I was making. Because I didn't have many toys, but I could pour candle wax into like the, the case of the action figure and make another action figure. Um, and I was so excited to show it to her and I spilled it everywhere. And I'm pretty sure she wanted to kill me. But I'm mostly confident she still loves me. And see, I think, I think love is so significant that I would even go so far as to say that love, like biblical love, is the fertilizer for Christ's likeness. Biblical love is, the, is the, the base for growing in likeness of Jesus Christ. Um, to, uh, huh, I just spaced out. Sorry about that. Um, when we, the person who understands biblical love, so the title of this, of this morning's sermon is The Fruity Christian. Um, it's definitely very tongue-in-cheek, but here's what I want you to understand. For the believer who understands biblical love, and we'll define that a little bit later, they're going to see much fruit in their life. They're going to see the growth of spiritual fruit in their jobs. They're going to see the growth of spiritual fruit in their families. And they're going to see the growth of spiritual fruit in their relationship with Christ. You know, and our text this morning goes, goes even beyond that. What, what Paul's going to talk about, they're not... They're five verses, but they're not lighthearted suggestions. Instead, he uses direct commands. They're significant things that when following, when, when being obedient to them, if, should you so desire to adhere to even one of these, you're going to see the production of just spiritual fruit in your life. You see, as Christians, we want to be making all kinds of fruit. We want to be fruity Christians. Now it's all coming together, right? That's, it's the fruity, like that. Um, so, let's get started. If you have your Bible with you, or you have your cell phone, go ahead and look up Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, and we're going to start in verse 9. So Romans 12, verse 9. Our first point is this, to love boldly. And you'll see this, there's this theme where each one of these verses is kind of built on this basis of biblical love. And you'll see each one. But to love boldly, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. You see, we're going to discover in, in this first verse that this very first verse kind of sets the tone for everything Paul is going to say from here on out. In fact, these first four words, let love be genuine. There's two major elements in there. So if ever you're doing Bible study by yourself, you want to circle love, you want to circle genuine. These are, these are significant identifying words. This first word, love, I see, I would say that like Paul is basically communicating that selfless love, if you've ever been familiar with the term agape love, that's what, that's Greek. That's the word that was being used in this. It's this unconditional love. It's this love I give unto you and expect nothing in return. Paul is saying that this selfless love, he's saying that what he's going to continue communicating is that this is supreme. And we'll see this all throughout scripture. Like consider Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39. And he said to him, this is Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So another one, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. You see, love for the believer is absolutely essential. In fact, John, the apostle John would go so far as to write that he who does not love abides in death. Love is absolutely significant for the believer. And we'll, we'll continue because we see right here where, where Paul writes that um, we are to let love be genuine. So we're talking about the significance of love, but now we're adding a condition to it. It needs to be genuine. Now that's, that's kind of self-explanatory, but some of you may have, uh, so I'm reading out the ESV. Some of you may have the translation uh, sincere. Um, if you go back even a little further, it'll say without dissimulation, if you're reading out the King James. The, the easiest way to, uh, well, the NLT has a great translation. It says, don't just pretend to love others really love them. The word comes from, like the, the literal translation is don't, like, is not playing a part. So like the way an actor plays a role. Don't fake this love. Let it be genuine. Now, some of us, you know, I mean, I think it's kind of easy to say, well, we can tell between some real love and some fake artificial love. But I mean, if you've ever seen the movie Frozen, like no one expected, I didn't expect Hans to be the bad guy. You know, Anna was going to marry him, and he wanted all the power for Ar Arendelle, all that stuff. But a better example, probably the best example of a ingenuine, a fake love, is a man who, who had so much love for his teacher that none of the other 11 men even realized it was all for show. You see, Judas loved Jesus but the moment that he betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver, we see the priority of his heart on display. His love was never for Jesus, not even for Jesus' teachings. His love was for what he could get from Jesus. That's not, that's not genuine love. What's happening is Paul is establishing a distinct type of love that the believer ought to subscribe to. You see, society, they're willing, they want to sell us all different types of love. And rightfully so. People are buying it. Supply and demand. But Paul is saying, let this love be genuine. Let the unconditional love that you have, this is, this, he's talking to the church, so this is, this is starting independently, how we love others. Let that be genuine, real, genuine, not, with, not, not fake, not playing a part, no hypocrisy. Pure. See, I... I think that would be absolutely amazing. Just phenomenal. If all of us in the church, if we, if we could just like wake up and just be able to love like that automatically. Like, can you imagine how like the, with the unity and everything that would come from all of us being able to love each other in that way? Like that would be absolutely crazy. We would be able to just love each other with, with no hidden agendas, with no, with no bitterness, with no, no hidden like motivation or anything, but just pure hearts. I mean, I think we'd, we, I, I, we'd see so much revival and spiritual awakening. We'd have to change church time to like harvest time. Because I mean, we'd be so much growth. When we're loving people the way Christ loves us, the way God loves us, it changes you. It's distinct. The second half of verse 9. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Now this seems kind of self-explanatory. Abhor, if you've never, that's kind of a, a funky word. It basically means like to hate, right? Some of you may have that translation. But even that, I don't think is, a, is the, the full depth of what Paul's trying to say. Because the word, I don't think English has a word for it. The Greek word has this idea of being so repulsed by something so repulsed that you not only detest it, you not only hate it, but you, are, you actually take action to avoid it. He says, abhor evil. Don't just hate evil and be like, that's wrong, but avoid it. Stay away from it. You see, this 
it's, it's deeper than just an emotional response. We can't just say, ugh, that's bad. We need to avoid it too. There's plenty of things we do that are bad that we don't avoid, like speeding. It's only two, three miles an hour. I mean, that's illegal. Well, yeah, it's okay. It's not that bad. You know, and I'm not trying, because I speed too, so I'm not trying to make a big treatise on that. But we begin to see that this love because this is like the other side of love. It's, it's, it's that love is not just an emotion. Because in the Bible, love isn't just a feeling. It's an actual act of our wills. It's something we will to do. This love isn't just like cutesy, huggy, you know, cuddle. It's, man, I, I, this means so much to me. And now it's affecting how I live. It's because if we just feel it, if we just acknowledge certain things, we're only halfway there. Because the love that Paul is talking about will change how we act. We'll be so repulsed by evil that we will avoid it. And we can trade out evil with sin. You see, biblical love will never lead us to do something that is contradictory to the will of God. You know, like for example, if, if you're like, oh man, it's your birthday. Well, happy birthday. I just stole this Mercedes Benz for you. Do you love it? I mean... You're showing love, right? You got him a brand new car. I would love that. But look what you did. You, you, did, you, you contradicted one edict of Scripture, one law of Scripture, so you could try and do this good thing. And that's not biblical love. We can get so caught up in what this love means. We think, oh, well, you know, it's kind of the whole Robin Hood mentality. I'm doing, a, I'm doing this thing that's not too good, but I'm doing it for a good reason. He steals from the rich to give to the poor. Well, I'm giving it to the poor, so it's good. You know, and... It's so funny, I, um, I think it's, it's these tiny little things that begin to, to eat away at us. It's the little white lies. It's the tiny little secrets we keep. It's the things we do in the dark when we don't think anyone's watching. It's these tiny little bits of evil. The part where it starts to step on people's toes is when we begin to talk about acceptable sins. What types of things are we accepting? What type of sin are we saying? Well, it's not that big a deal. Everyone lies on their taxes. It's just a little, it's not really fraud. And there's a list of other things, I'm not going to go down them, but there's so many things that we, people call them pet sins. It's just like, oh, it's, it's not that big a deal. You're supposed to be repulsed. We ought to be repulsed by evil and not just say this is wrong, but say this is so wrong and I love God so much and I see that love so much that I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to change my behavior. Now this gets really tricky. This kind of begins to inconvenience us. There's a lot of really cool movies and shows I've never got to see. I mean, there's some really cool things. But for me, and this may be different for every single one, is for me, I cannot let certain images and certain uh, music and certain words into my life. And that's between you and God, what your, what your, what your measurement is on that. But for me, I've, like, I don't get to talk to people about um, like Game of Thrones or something. Like, like, I mean, that, maybe it's fine for you. That's, that's great. But I know for myself, my relationship with Christ, I, I can't involve myself in certain things. And I'm like, man, I bet it seems like such a cool show. God is better. I mean, we were saying that Jesus is better, right? You see, we, we say things like, it's only hurting me, or it's not that big of a deal. But Paul in verse 9 is saying it is a big deal. Abhor it. Be so repulsed that you avoid it. It is a big deal. Do not let yourself be deceived. It's so easy. We lie to ourselves. We, we, we say it's not that big a deal. You'll hear it. You'll hear it. It won't even be you. The enemy wants to speak it to you. Just whisper, it's not that big a deal. And then once you do it, he's like, that's a big deal. I can't believe you did that. He accuses you. The accuser, right? I've never read much of, um, actually, before I get there, <laughs> in uh, Jude chapter one, this is a great verse. See, Paul's saying we need to take a stand against, against depravity. And there's a warning even. Jude writes, but you beloved, building yourselves up in, the most, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And then basically what he's saying is like, even when you're being involved in, in trying to help others, you've got to be careful to protect yourself. 
I mean, if you've ever, like, whenever the um, Ebola was coming to the United States, I mean, I saw the pictures, like, in the news. The doctors were going in trying to save these people's lives, but they were wearing full-on gear. You got to protect yourself. I mean, get in there, but you got to protect yourself still because even just the tiniest bit of sin, even that's the tiniest hint of it, it'll grow. It's a toxin, y'all, and it's going to do it slowly because if any one of us were to come back next Sunday, be just completely, like, needles hanging out of our arms and half-dressed, somebody would notice. Like, what happened to you last week? The alarm bells would go off everywhere, right? Like, this person needs help. But sin wants to do it slowly, piece by piece. When you start over here and one day at a time, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. And next thing you know it, you're outside of the church and you think there's no way I could ever go back. And that's a lie. Don't believe that. I was saying earlier, I don't, I don't, I've never read too much of Beth Moore. I've never actually done a Beth Moore study, being that I'm a guy. And she's great with all these women's Bible studies. But I think she's just a great biblical scholar as well. And she had this great quote. Let us not divorce ourselves from the truth of the scriptures for the sake of showing the love of Jesus. These two remain forever inseparable. To relish in one is a responsibility to relish in another. May the Spirit keep us ever mindful of this responsibility and privilege. You see, to love boldly is to love selflessly. It's seeking nothing in return. But it's not just an emotional thing. We're, we, we take a stand against evil and we, we take actions to avoid it because we're so repulsed by it. Let's move on to the next one. Verse 10. Our next point here is love together. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. See, this is such a cool verse. We're moving from uh, Paul focusing on the, the Christian independently to the Christian corporately, the, the believer and the whole body of the church, how we act with one another, how we respond to one, how we treat one another. And so we have this, this, um, this idea that Paul's saying the church and this Maybe a new idea. Um, I know Pastor Daryl spoke about the purpose of the church last week. The purpose of the church, he says that it's supposed to function a little bit like an extended family. That we have this brotherly love, this idea of, you're like my brother. You know, we're, we're, we're together forever. I will, I, will, I will not forget you. I love you. I care about you. And see, I love this. I was talking to some of the youth kids about this this morning. Because unlike, like, other than church and maybe a kindergarten classroom, I'm not sure many places where you go where it's a rule to love each other. Like a lot of places, that's not part of the like, that's not part of the normal thing. I mean, like you can go to the Broncos Patriots game, people don't love each other there. You know, you go to the King Supers parking lot, no love. Um, I-25 Monday morning, you all know what it's going to be like tomorrow. There's no love. It's, you, know, you get in, you don't turn on, I, I do my signal like right as I'm going in, I'm one of those people. Um, it's hard, it's hard. And see, it's so cool because not only are we to love one another, but Paul says, outdo one another. I'm like, this is great. We're already supposed to love each other like a family, but now, including to that, we're supposed to like be better than each other at loving each other. It's like this awesome cycle of where we just keep loving each other and, and serving one another. I mean, I think that'd be great. I would love a whole bunch of people to love me. That's just fun. And I'm sure you would too. Hopefully, you should. Love is good. Um, Let's keep going. Philippians 2, 3. I want, to, I want you all to see how this is talked about several times in Scripture. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Do one more. First Peter having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. It's got biblical love again, right? That pure heart. You see this, this compassion to count others as more important than ourselves is so valuable. I mean, it, just consider the opposite. Let, let, let's say we don't try to love each other. I love this quote uh, from theologian John Calvin. He says, there is no poison there is no poison more effective in alienating affections than the thought that one is despised. You see, whenever you feel like someone doesn't like you, you feel like they despise you, it makes it really hard to be friends with them. You're like, you don't even like me. Why are we talking? I'm not going to help you. 
It makes it really hard to like them. And, and that's the opposite thing. Like, like the question now is, is how? So if that's the opposite, how do we get to this point of outdoing one another and showing honor? And I mean, it can be so simple, y'all. Like, like let someone have the last chocolate donut in the lobby kind of thing to maybe just having a conversation with someone about their week and letting them vent. It has nothing to do with you. You know that they're actually the one who messed up the whole time, but you're going to listen and you're going to say, that's, man, I feel for you. Just showing compassion. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the base place to start. It's easy. Listening, sharing. I mean, like we're kind of going back to that kindergarten class, right? Like these are simple things, simple things that we can take on. Verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. We're talking about loving God now in this one. You see, something to note, and I, as I was studying this, I kind of spent a little bit of time like, what is Paul talking about right here? Paul doesn't simply write, do not be slothful. He's being a little more specific He's saying, do not be slothful in zeal. Kind of another way of saying is that when you're, when you're really passionate about something, don't, don't be lazy to pursue it. I'm like, man, like, oh, I, I wish I could do this. I wish I could change that. And then you just kind of sit back and like Paul's saying, like, like, don't, don't be slothful in your zeal. And even like, even Jesus knew this because the reality is all of us today, like, this is the youngest you're ever going to be. Like, there, I mean, there's a, there is a time limit on all this stuff that we, can, that we can do while we're here. And Jesus says in John 9, 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Night is coming when no one can work. There is a sense of urgency. Do not be slothful in your zeal. The next part of this, it's a, kind of like a triplet. To be fervent in spirit. So this is actually like a Greek idiom. It's kind of like a little catchphrase. It pretty much meant be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. This idea of being kind of impassioned and inflamed and excited and um, ardent, right? I, I love this quote from this theologian. He's a contemporary guy named Douglas Moo. He says, Paul views the Holy Spirit as the agent who creates enthusiasm within us for the things of the Lord. But the use of the command here, because it's a command tense, indicates that the Spirit does not do this work automatically. We need to allow the Spirit to inflame our passions for Christ, His will, and His people. So we're being set on fire by the Holy Spirit. The last part, serve the Lord. This is really cool because this is how Paul ties all of the ideas together. Our service to God is the antidote to slothfulness. You see, when we're, when we're serving God, we're not just being lazy. We're not just sitting back. We're, we're, we're stepping up to the front lines. We're saying, God, I'm here. Use me. And then it's, like, it's so hard to be slothful when you're dedicated to serving God. And, and when we're serving Him, it increases our fervency. We're more passionate. We get, we're seeing the difference we're making. If you've ever gone to help with Operation Christmas Child, I mean, you get excited. If you've ever been able to do one of the Salvation Army things where you ring the bell, um, you, I, that job is kind of hard, actually, because you're outside in the cold. But you might be excited. I would be excited. I want to do that someday. I shouldn't be slothful. I'll do it next year, this year. Um, but like when we're serving God, we get excited. We absolutely get excited. It, it brings up that fervency in the spirit again, right? And see, here's the funny thing. The, the last part, serve the Lord, is the whole purpose. Serving God grow, takes us out of slothfulness. Serving God creates fervency in us. But serving God is also the reason why we're zealous. Serving God is the reason why we're so passionate and excited to do work and be on mission for God. The whole thing all works together. See, when I first came to Belmar, um, I was at a staff meeting. This is back at, like in June, I think. Um, Actually, I, June 8th, I remember I took a picture. I saw it on my notes. Um, and I was being told about some of the, like, different volunteers in the youth ministry. And I was told about this one guy, a young dude named Dakota West. He wanted to volunteer and help. And I was like, all right, cool. I was told he was kind of a neat guy. And um, actually, Gerald didn't use that word, but that's kind of the feel I got. Like, he's, he's a unique dude. And so I remember meeting him. And here's this guy that has... <laughs> No offense, but like no, no major experience, no obvious skill set to be in ministry, but he has a heart and a passion 
And I didn't invite him. I don't even know how the, I'm assuming he was like, hey, I want to help serve. And he was not slothful in his zeal. He said, here's something I want to do. Here's something God's at work in. I want to go be a part of it. Use me. Another person, Aaron uh, Leggett. I once heard her say in an interview where she was talking about the bird's nest, this, this organization she's starting up or she's working to start with. And, and she said, the time is now. Like, if, like, there's no reason to wait till tomorrow or next year to help these people in Haiti. The time is now. There's a sense of urgency. And now, I don't think either of these, these two students would, would say, oh, I'm, I'm this zealot of Christ. No, they're just people who are broken and, and are hurting because they, they see the need and they want, they want to see God come to them. They want to be a part of God's work and they're saying, I'm going to go do it right now. There's no need to wait. See, if you're passionate about something and you think God, and you see God at work in it, the time is now. You don't, you don't have to have it all together. Moses was like, God, I, I can barely talk. And God says, who made man able to even speak? You know, Scott paraphrased. Like, God will equip you. Trust in it. Trust in it. Verse 12. Love faithfully. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Y'all, man, if there's a verse that you want to memorize out of this whole thing, here's a good one. This whole thing, we're going to see that same cycle type thing that Paul did, and maybe you can already kind of predict it. It's so cool. See, hope is the foundry of perseverance. Hope is, is the, um, the manufacturing plant of endurance. Hope is, is powerful, Fully grown and matured, hope is unwavering. It is unshakable. It is immovable. And we put our hope in God because we have the greatest hope of all. It's eternal life. Jesus says this in Luke 10, 20. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Like, how phenomenal is that? No matter what's going on, no matter what you're going through, like, we know how the story ends. Like, spoiler alert, glory's on the horizon. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's eternal paradise with the Lord our God. You see, we don't only have hope for the future, but we have hope for the present right now. This, this is such a cool verse. 1 Corinthians 15, um, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Parents, if you're, if you're out there struggling with your kids, be steadfast. Your labor is not in vain. Husbands, wives, if you're, if you're going through something really hard right now and you're, you're trying to figure this out, your labor is not in vain. Students trying to finish out the year, employed, unemployed, in Christ, your labor is not in vain. This is the hope we have for the present. And our names are written in heaven. We have a hope for the future. Hope is powerful. And that's what takes us to this next point. Because Paul calls us to be patient in affliction. You see, we must endure to the end. And it's because of our great hope in Christ Jesus that we can be encouraged during times of tribulation and, and testing and stress. And here's... A reminder, Romans 5, 2 through 5. Through him, this is Paul writing this as well, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, that one part right here, hope does not put us to shame. If you've ever been stood up or left out in the rain, God's not going to do that to you. You're not going to be left out on the curb holding your, your little bowl of hope saying, God, what, what, what went wrong? What happened? His promise is eternal. I, I always, I'm always humbled by the fact that I'm only 27. I don't know all of the storms this life can bring to us. I don't know that, but literally this morning I heard on the radio this quote from Corey Ten Boom. It said, we don't have to be 
scared of an uncertain, of an unknown future, when we trust in a known God. When we know who's holding the keys, when we know who's holding all the power, we don't have to be afraid of the future. His promise is eternally, eternity, paradise in heaven with him. And yeah, there's, this book is filled with people who had quite the adventure to get there. And it was hard. But I think there's a, there are things learned in pain and suffering that are not found in luxury. There's an intimacy with Christ that I think can only be seen in the darkest of nights. And God's, I pray God's mercy we don't have to go through those things, but sometimes that's what he uses to teach us. That's what he uses to shape us. I gotta find myself again. You see, here's that last part. Be faithful in prayer or be constant in prayer because that, that's the trick. Prayer is the key to the whole thing. You see, on our own, it's almost impossible for us to truly, truly, sincerely put our hope in eternity. It's almost impossible for us to truly put our hope in what God's doing right now to help us carry the burden from every day to the next day to the next day. I mean, Christ says, take up your cross and follow me. To bear the weight of that cross is hard. And without prayer, I would dare say it's impossible. You see, prayer is the vehicle that we access God's reservoir of infinite strength. Through prayer, we access the reservoir of God's infinite strength and it pours into our lives. And with God, says God and his word says, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Then I want to be with God so all things can be possible. And that is what prayer unlocks in your life. And it changes you. It changes your heart. It changes your soul. It changes how you love. If you're struggling with someone, pray for them every single day. Really pray for them. Like not, like that country song, I pray a piano falls on them or their brakes go out on the cliff. I'm not that kind of pray. But the like, God, help me to love them. Lord, bring them closer to you. You will see your heart begin to soften toward them. You can't, you can't break your heart and pray for someone and not also love them at the same time. It's just kind of one of the things that happens. Verse 13, love people. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. You know, love people, saints. We'll talk about the hospitality in a second. There's a, there's a definite call for the Christian, the believer, the follower of Christ to love all people and show the love of Christ to the world. We, we get that. That's, that is a common thread. But Paul is saying, especially, like do that and especially love the fellow believer. The saints contribute to the needs. You see, the church in Rome was, was really difficult. It wasn't just one building. They, they couldn't meet together. It was heavily persecuted. There were several little home churches where a lot of people met. And oftentimes travel was really dangerous. Travel was really, really hard. And people would open up their homes and, and, and share meals with other Christians. They didn't really know them but they were to help the other Christian. And, and even though right now in Lakewood in 2017, I, I have to say we're probably not experiencing violent persecution in the way that the church in Rome was, but the need is still the same. There's still a need for community, excuse me, there's still a need for fellowship and love and, and for someone to say, hey man, how you doing? Is there anything I can pray about for you right now? I once read in this book, if it's worth talking about, it's worth praying about. You don't have to go home and pray. You can, I mean, we're in church, pray. You can pray right there in the back. You can pray right there in the row. And, and oh, it's, it's so exciting. It's so encouraging for me to look over and see like two people held together, three, four, all praying. And I'm like, I want to be a part of that. I want to go, you know, I want to pray over there too. Like, I get excited, you know, God's at work. It's excited. The last part is to seek to show hospitality. When I first heard the word hospitality, I, I was pretty certain it was like, you know, fill up people's cups and, and give, cook them food when they come over. And, you know, that's, that's kind of like an extension, you know. That's not exactly the exact definition, but that is a result. Here's a really cool thing about hospitality. Y'all know I'm, I love doing all this Greek stuff, right? 
So the hospitality, the word in Greek, because the New Testament was written originally in Greek, it's actually like a compound word, but the word is philoxenia, or for y'all, philoxenia, or philoxenia. And it's two words, without getting super complex, philo, or philo, love, like to love affectionately, and xenia, stranger, or foreigner. So literally, to love the stranger, to love the foreigner. And so this really kind of uh, hit home the first point Paul was saying. Like, there were tons of Christians traveling in and out of Rome. It was a big city. And they needed a place to stay. They needed food. A lot of the inns were way too expensive and filled with crime. And and we show this love to the stranger among us. And and now I'm not saying we all have to open our homes to everybody. You don't necessarily have to do that. But, I mean, how easy is it to look over to your, to your left or to your right when you come into church and, and maybe you see someone you don't know. Maybe they're sitting by themselves and, and you just say hi or maybe invite them to sit with you or you sit with them and maybe it, it may feel a little awkward, but you're reaching out. And I'm, I'm mostly preaching to myself right now because I'm not that good at this. I'm, I'm trying to get better. I'm starting in my section. And so I'm, I'm slowly getting, getting to y'all. So I'm gonna get all of y'all and I'm coming. So Daryl, I'm gonna be there hopefully before December. I, do, I try to do like two people, two people a week. But I mean, we can, we can really get to know each other. Like, I think what he's talking about is the church ought to be so, the, the church members ought to be so intertwined with one another that if someone left, man, we'd really miss them. Not just like, oh man, they were funny. But like, oh my gosh, they prayed for me. They, they meant so much to my heart. Not that you're mad to see them go, but man, you're, you're sad. And we see it in Paul all the time. He's like, I, my heart breaks. I wish I could come to you right now. He's writing this to all these different churches. That's, that's, where, that's where this hospitality, this, this love for the stranger, because the reality is a lot of us, you know, we don't really know each other that much. Um, I know a bunch of y'all's first names, but I don't know your last names. I don't know where you were born. Like, I want to get, get to know those things, and it takes time, and it feels a little awkward sometimes. Um, the last thing, I had this whole really cool story, conclusion thing I was going to talk about, but I watched this movie last night. Um, and man, God really just hit home on me. I watched it with Marianne, and it was, it's a movie about a, a crisis going on in the world that is so, so heinous and so wretched and so disgusting and vile that most of us would rather not even talk about it, let alone do something about it. It's a movie about something so antithetical, something so against the very fiber of humanity that you're just shaken, you're disturbed in in a way that you've never felt before. The movie was called Nefarious, The Merchant of Souls. It's a movie about uh, human sex trafficking. Girls and children, young boys, um, I think the conservative estimate is 30 million people are kidnapped, tricked, bought, sold, stolen, drugged, whatever, coerced into sexual slavery, into prostitution. One guy even said at this, this bar you could go to, you could buy um, like a beer for $4. You could buy fries, or a beer was five, fries for $4. And you could buy one of the girls for $3. It's cheaper than French fries. You had an hour to do whatever you wanted with her. This, this is so disgusting. In the United States alone, 100,000 are children. Has there ever been a time where the love of God was needed more? There's... There's crimes being live streamed on the internet. Has there ever been a time where the love of God has been needed more? There are shootings from Florida to Syria to all over the world for no reason. Has the love of God ever been needed more? And there are, there are babies who aren't even born yet whose bodies are sold off piece by piece. Has there ever been a time where the love of God was needed more, church? You see, 
We don't have the, the luxury anymore to sit down and just turn up our nose and say, well, those are sinners and the world has fallen and I got Jesus and I'm good. No, Jesus lived in paradise, y'all. He was in heaven and he came down to earth. He came down and got dirty. He came down and got bloody. He came down and, and got crucified. That's our example, church. I, I pray your heart breaks and I pray it never heals. There is so, there's too much injustice for us just to, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. We love, we are able to love at all because God first loved us. Paul's outlined these commands. Follow these things. Just pick one even. Live it. Try it out. No, commit to it. And you will see spiritual fruit. Church, we've got to see a revival. We've got to see an awakening. There are far too many people right down the street believing in false gods. Every time I drive past this mushroom building, I pray and my heart breaks. How can I just drive by while people are being fooled? You gotta get messy. You've gotta get in places that feel uncomfortable. You've gotta do things that seem weird. Because love does weird things, y'all. Love sends his only son to die on a cross for sinners. I pray you're moved by that as much as I am. Let's pray.